Master Institute of Visual Cultures. Uh, I see some familiar faces. Uh, Sebastian's research group, very welcome here this evening, this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> this is the third in our public lecture series uh, on performative defiance. The Chair of Autonomy, Professor Sebastian Olma, who's sitting over here, um, has been negotiating this idea of performativity uh, interlocked with defiance. And um, as some of you know, we've been innovating, renewing all our programs at the Master Institute. And this notion of performative defiance became critical within this renewal process. <laughs> Sebastian also helped us think through that. And, um, and one of the things that comes out of that, or that's written in his uh, uh, book on this subject matter, which you can all read, called Art, Autonomy, Art, Art, <laughs> Art and Autonomy, Past, Present and Future. The past, present and future is very important because he looks also at the notion of the contemporary. So the problematic with the notion of the contemporary, Sebastian writes, is that it uh, does not, it's like a tread, treadmill. It does not look back and it does not look forward. So there's a sort of continuum. In these discussions, we talked about the idea of a post-contemporary. So one of our tutors, Charles Landfrucht, is going to write the theory around this notion of the post-contemporary. We also have uh, three new programs. Um, and in these three programs, this idea of futurability is present. So Sandra van der Eyck is core tutor of our new program, Ecology Futures. She's with us today, which is really wonderful. And a uh, visual arts program is called, the subtitle, Post-Contemporary Practice. So we're really excited to develop with Sebastian and Charles together. They will develop the theory around that through the research uh, that they're doing at Corad. Um, and this is also, too, in our program, Situated Design. So on that note, I'm going to stop. I'm going to introduce Sebastian. Sebastian will expand further, I guess, on the notion of performativity, and uh, will probably give a little introduction to uh, Patricia Reed as well. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, thanks. That's my introduction. Uh, no, um, as Una said, uh, thanks for the uh, kind words. Um, my name is Sebastian Olmer. I'm a professor at uh, Karat, the Center of Applied Research for Art, Design and Technology. And I'm not going to expand on anything, but uh, going to uh, say that how happy and delighted we are to have uh, Patricia Reed uh, with us uh, this evening. Um, Patricia. Uh, has become, uh, I think, a constant uh, a guest or a sort of a returning visitor. Uh, I think this is the third time uh, she's been here in the space of roughly uh, a year, or a year and a half. Two years. Two years? Right. Don't correct me, please. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, right, two years. And uh, the reason, one of the reasons why we do that, why we you know, think uh, that it's worthwhile uh, you know, re re-inviting or inviting again and again uh, Patricia is that she is this um, this is the living proof that you can be artist, designer and political philosopher uh, uh, you know, in one in one person and, um, and, and I think that's important, you know, for, for, for us, for our students also to know that, uh, you know, that, 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 you know, there are not natural barriers between these different disciplines and it can be quite interesting and um, and sort of reinforcing these kind of different uh, disciplines if you venture into all of them. Um, the fact that uh, Patricia is uh, a brilliant uh, designer, you can uh, see, for instance, if you go on the Laboria, La, La, Laboria Cubonics uh, Xenofeminism website, or if you visit the uh, web journal that the two of us uh, published uh, together last year, um, called, no, the, early this year, uh, the first issue, makingandbreaking.org. Uh, I mean, it's absolutely fabulous uh, work, and um, but also, you know, Patricia is a uh, is a, a very interesting um, uh, philosopher, or you know, theoretic uh, uh, theorist. Um, she would probably uh, modestly say um, it's interesting because Patricia uh, was born in uh, in, in Canada uh, originally, and then came to Europe about 15 years ago been living most of that uh, time, I think, uh, in, in Berlin with uh, sort of intermissions. And what she does is, in her work, is, you know, which you know, 
excites me as someone who's been working in uh, you know theory for a long time is sort of bringing together these two traditions of continental European philosophy and also you know analytical philosophy, uh, which of course is also at home in Europe, but is a more sort of thing that happens uh, on the American continent a bit a bit more. So she is not just a designer and a philosopher, but also you know a thinker who doesn't shy away from uh, you know all kinds of uh, mathematical uh, you know theorems. Uh, who, who you know has um, uh, yeah, who sort of sharpens her, her thought also on the um, uh, uh, you know on the edges of mathematics, if you will. Um, her talk today, uh, if I think I've said everything I needed to say, yes, her, her talk today is entitled "Zeno Feminism and Planetary Orientation," and uh, uh, as most of you know. Uh, Patricia is uh, one of the um, co one of the authors of you know, Xenofeminist Manifesto that came out in 2015 and has just been uh, published in book form uh, by by Verso. But her work, you know, transcends that the Xenofeminism, uh, uh, and uh, you know, she is an obsessive uh, publisher because I mean, there is no book that stands to her name. But uh, you know, the, the the output in terms of book chapters. And articles that she had uh, only that you know over the last twelve months uh, is worth I think at least uh, two or three books. So, um, having said that, uh, without further uh, ado, um, uh, Zeno feminism and planetary uh, uh, orientation. Uh, welcome, Patricia. Thank you. So this is so weird. You feel like a TED talk when it's like walking around that you can just saunter up and be like, thanks. It's also what you expected to do now. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, um, but thank you so much for that very kind introduction. It's always like so feel like kind of second home here because you've been so hospitable with me over the last years, um, and also a thanks to uh, to Wilma Deepens for the travel logistics. I don't know if she's here. She's probably got more sense than to sit here and listen to this. Um, and uh, <laughs> oh well. Thank you very much for all your all your help over these years, and also thanks to whoever made that amazing poster. If you're here, that's I love that poster. That is so. It's like this. You come into the building and it's like Saul Bass vertigo thing. So, thank you. Very nice. Um, yeah, and uh, just another mention too is just like uh, having been involved with Seb before on the making and breaking journal uh, that we released in January in uh, Rotterdam. Uh, some of these ideas, I, I'm kind of grateful to have had that, um, you know, uh, opportunity sponsored by the university for for that endeavor because it's actually allowed me. It kind of kickstarted a new uh, kind of trajectory of thought that I've been kind of working on, elaborating since January. So it was a it was a good kind of kick in the you know what and uh, has you know, spawned onto things. But there's definitely the point of origination is is there. Yeah, no, What's I that? that, that sort of that, line, yeah. yeah, 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 that was the kind of uh, title uh, image. It's from a video game called Everything. Um, so yeah, the, the plan this afternoon is to just sort of uh, outline, to kind of give you a little, a very brief introduction to the Xeno Feminist Manifesto through kind of like, uh, let's say, the, um, the condensed version uh, through four points. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of use it as a starting point because uh, one of the things that I should mention about it is, um, is that, uh, okay, it was written by six women. We all come from different fields. We all have different sort of priorities uh, that are embedded in the manifesto. So we're all kind of working through it in our own fields. And my uh, angle happens to be more in the like feminist epistemologies, feminist reason uh, sort of angle. Um, and basically, we uh, yeah. So basically, um, we met uh, at a workshop in Berlin in 2014 called "Navigation as Emancipation" or "Emancipation as Navigation." I never remember exactly. Um, and we kind of sensed a need to articulate a genre of feminism that is amenable to the complexity of our vertiginous reality. Um, so a reality that is. Uh, these are just sort of images of. This is the English book, and these are some of the, um, this is the French book coming out uh, probably within a month, and this is a K Korean version here. Um, but yes, yeah, so we wanted to adapt a feminism that was, uh, that was amenable to the kind of reality of cross-hatched cross fiber optic cables, 
radio and microwaves, um, oil and gas pipelines, aerial and shipping routes, and the unrelenting simultaneous execution of millions of communi uh, communication protocols with every passing millisecond. So that's to quote the manifesto. So our name, uh, Laboria Cubonics, it's actually coming from, it's an anagram of Nicola Bourbaki, which was a group of largely sort of French mathematicians from the mid 20th century. Um, and they, they formed a group uh, focusing on, because they wanted to kind of advocate for a, the increased abstraction and genericity of mathematics. And they kind of knew at the time that if they were to publish these ideas under their own name, they'd be like kind of shunned from their peer group. So they basically used this name, the book, which is a now famous Bubaki group for anyone who's like interested in mathematics, it still exists. Um, they used that name to, uh, when they were trying to like author their papers and get these sort of ideas circulating. Um, and the subtitle of our, of our manifesto is A Politics for Alienation. And this is a kind of provocation to consider uh, alien alienation as a necessary condition to be embraced for substantial change, um, which means to us learning how to negotiate the unfamiliar, right? The future will always be this kind of in this vein of, of unfamiliarity. Um, and of course, there's been controversy around like why we chose that term. So there's been you know quite a bit of uh, critical critical attention on that term. Um, so to be just very clear with you, when I say the term alienation, I'm not talking about uh, the type of debilitating alienation that is very alive and well in sort of like the conventions of using that term to discuss labor relations, or the type of alienation certain bodies um, uh, experience from the social sphere due to uh, gender, class, or, or racial markers. Um, it's rather to make a claim on what we can think of as epistemic alienation. Hang on, let me just stick that down there. Um, as a way to kind of create conceptual separations from familiar orders and their existing norms that actually produce such oppressive forms of social exclusion. So our use of alienation outside of this kind of exclusively negative monopoly uh, has been to kind of highlight the ways in which the idea of overcoming alienation in an absolute sense leads to a regime of sameness. So it's not unlike Hegel's observation that uh, familiarity obstructs possibility, right? So our kind of idea is that in order to capture this critical plasticity of the way we organize uh, worlds, coexistence, and how humans see themselves within it, Epistemic alienation can be seen as a mode of escape from the given pragmatic and cognitive constraints if we learn to embrace its force of estrangement from what we think we know in order to sort of ramify pathways for other modes of, of, of other structures of coexistence. Um, and so again, so this, this picture of alienation sort of folds into the use of, of the prefix xeno, right? Um, which has also kind of caused controversy because, of course, you know, when, when the manifesto was written, we weren't exactly in the same political climate as we are now. When Usually when we hear this word xeno, we hear it associated with xenophobia. So this is, people are kind of very nervous about this prefix, but it, it's a prefix. So there's also xenophilie, right? Love of the strange, love of the unfamiliar. It's just a prefix and we want to make a claim on that. And so in this way, it's used to kind of it's useful to sort of like just highlight the etymological sense of what Zeno is, this prefix. And it's composed actually of three parts. So Zenos, of course, does refer to foreignness, but more precisely, it's someone outside of a particular known community with no clearly defined relationship or something outside of familiar modes of identification or epistemic classification. A second, you know, uh, second meaning of Xenos, is as an enemy or stranger. It's something unknown, which is potentially either a promise or a threat. So there's a sort of ambiguity. And the, the third part is Xenos can be kind of, uh, the prefix Xeno can be kind of stand in for what's known as a guest friendship. And this is in, in opposition to philos, right? The root of philosophy, which is a kind of more permanent, uh, intimate type of friendship. Um, so it's a kind of guest relationship to the unknown. 
And what this triple sort of signification of Zenos indicates is an inherent, inherent uncertainty or ambiguity as to the status of an unknown entity. So with, with Laboria Cubonics, we see this prefix as a sort of demand to create conditions of hospitality to this unfamiliar. And this is captured by the relation between Zenos and Xenia. And this is an ancient Greek protocol for obligatory hospitality. So Xenia illustrated, this is a kind of myth, mythical thing here. Uh, Xenia is illustrated through several myths where gods make appearances as humans to test a given community in their enactment of Xenia by seeking uh, refuge as strangers. So in Xenofeminism, we see Zeno as a sort of navigational principle, as a hosting, a sort of hosting imperative, extending to both human and non-human interrelations, as well as to epistemic uh, negotiations with the unknown. And, you know, clearly without the ambition, or perhaps not clearly, but uh, I should stress without the ambition to tame those relations into ones of sameness, uh, familiarity, or homogeneity. So again, uh, just to emphasize that Laboria Cubonics is not a collective in this kind of conventional sense of a, of a per perfectly, unified, uh, <laughs> perfectly unified message or political position. We're more of a working group, so we're constantly staying in touch. But in fact, we've only actually commonly authored this one document. And since that time, we're all sort of working on, on chunks, of, uh, chunks of problems, of ideas on our inner, within our own fields. Um, but nonetheless, there's sort of uh, four main positions that I just wanted to sort of like map out. It's the, it's the condensed JPEG version, if you will, of the manifesto. Um, so the first point would be to make claims on feminist reason. And this is, you know, I'd just like to kind of highlight the, or make a note of the philosopher Deborah K. Hikes, who warned in her plea um, to align struggles of oppression alongside reason um, because abandoning claims on truth uh, means also to abandon uh, claims on truth of oppression, right? So this is like important point to kind of make a claim on reason. So this is to quote section zero, uh, X04, zero so we've numbered all our sections in binary. Uh, to claim that reason or rationality is by nature a patriarchal enterprise is to concede defeat. It is true that the canonical history of thought is dominated by men, and it is male hands we see throttling existing institutions of science and technology. But this is precisely why feminism must be irrationalism, because of this miserable imbalance and not despite it. There's no feminine um, rationality, nor is there a masculine one. Science is not an expression, but a suspension of gender. If today it is dominated by masculine egos, then it is at odds with itself, and this contradiction can be leveraged. So this, the second sort of main point that we want to, that we want to highlight is a kind of position on gender abolitionism. Um, and, and to quote, this is from section 0x0e, gender abolitionism is not a code for the eradication of what is currently considered gender traits from the human population. Under patriarchy, uh, such a project can only spell disaster. The notion of what is gendered sticks disproportionately to the feminine. But even if this balance were redressed, we have no interest in seeing the sexuate diversity of the world reduce. Let a hundred sexes bloom. So gender abolitionism is shorthand for the ambition to construct a society where the traits currently assembled under the rubric of gender no longer furnish a grid for the asymmetric operation of power. So point, the third sort of main, one of the core points is a kind of position on anti-naturalism. And this is like something you see in a lot of feminist discourse, right? Um, and I should be clear for those of you not familiar with the term, anti-naturalism does not mean against nature, right? <laughs> but it's about disentangling norms from facts. So what, uh, like, you know, how um, when certain artificial norms are rehearsed or practiced in such, you know, repeated in such a way that become imagined as if they are facts of nature, when in fact they are uh, artificial, plastic social norms and therefore subject to mutability. So to quote from section 0x01, 
Anyone who's been deemed unnatural in the face of reigning biological norms, anyone who's experienced injustices wrought in the name of natural order, will realize that the glorification of nature has nothing to offer us. The queer and trans among us, the differently abled, as well as those who have suffered discrimination due to pregnancy and duties connected to child re rearing, xenofeminism is vehemently anti-naturalist. Essentialist naturalism reeks of theology. The sooner it is exercised, the better. And just to kind of like wrap up the intro to Xenofem, um, this last point on universalism. Again, some of, I'm kind of I'm touching on certain points. Uh, some of them, it should be noted, have been received with more critical, and, and you know, rightfully so, critical uh, critical reception than, than others. Um, but nonetheless, so on the point four on universalism from section 0x, uh, 0f, um, xenofeminism understands that the viability of emancipatory abolitionist projects hinges on a profound reworking of the universal. The universal must be grasped as generic, which is to say intersectional. Intersectionality is not uh, the morselation of collectives into a static fuzz of cross-referenced identities, but a political orientation that slices through every particular, refusing the crass pigeonholing of bodies, right? This is not a universal that can be imposed from above, but built from the bottom up, or better, laterally, opening new lines of transit across an uneven landscape. This non-absolute generic universality must guard against the facile tendency of conflation with bloated, unmarked particulars, namely Eurocentric universalism, whereby the male is mistaken for sexless, the white for raceless, the cis for real, and so on. So with that sort of just, you know, like I said, the condensed sort of overview of, of some of the main points of the manifesto. I mean, it's not exactly a very long text, under 5,000 words. Um, I should just stress that we've been very uh, fortunate to have had the manifesto circulated and translated widely. It's been an incredibly humbling experience, as you can never expect that to, to happen, um, especially from those who've been highly disapproving of its contents, um, since I think it's exactly those moments uh, that allow for critical self-reflection. Um, so in many ways, the reception of the text has been a great reminder that one never thinks alone. And that's an incredibly important uh, lesson to kind of think generously alongside adversarial positions if one's to maintain a sort of fidelity to reasoning at all. And this fidelity, of course, always includes the possibility of fallibility. And one is kind of always forever challenged by, by different perspectives. So I think it's been an important lesson to, as much as possible, try to you know, remove one's ego when taking in critiques, since you actually don't get very far in thinking um, simply by confirming what you believe or what you hold to be right. Um, and I think it's precisely this competitive game of being right at work in a lot of academia and a lot of the pressures of being in academia um, that are sort of about scoring points uh, under the illusion of being a privatized thinker, um, that the ability to actually open productive spaces of reasoning as collective and social practice ultimately suffers, right? I think the kind of structure of a, lo a lot of the sort of competition models you see alive and well in academia are as if we're just kind of atomized thinkers in competition with each other when in fact we deeply need each other to cope. Like every thinking is a deprivatized act and it needs to be adjudicated and acknowledged as such. Um, part of the reason I'm happy to be a para-academic, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so, okay, so that said, um, I'm gonna move on to, like, so what are, what are we doing now? What are it like, that's, you know, that was like the four years old version. Uh, so what's going on now? Um, so this is the kind of part where I'll go more into this question of planetary orientation. Um, and of course, one of the main points or, or one of the main catalysts of writing the Xenofeminist Manifesto was really this question I think a lot of us are trying to grapple with is like, how are we going to deal with this multi-scalar crisis that we're facing right now? We don't have 
We don't have the concepts. A lot of times we, have the we certainly don't have the institutions. And like, how are we going to, how are we going to deal with, this, with these kind of problems? And a lot of my work is kind of still, it's, it's, it's working through those kind of questions. Um, and yeah, so basically how to deal with this context of complex planetary entanglement that we find ourselves in. Um, so following some kind of cues from the philosopher Sylvia Winter, who noted that as post-nuclear creatures now faced with this climate catastrophe, uh, for the first time in human history, um, we're now forced to come to terms with an environment in common. It's an environment in common uh, that is experienced and lived in vastly uncommon ways. So just to be clear, when I say an environment in common, I don't mean this is homogenous. Um, ultimately, we are faced with the challenge of learning to coexist at a scale we've never before had to cope with. And it's because of this demand that substantial transformations to the very foundations and how we see the world, how we understand ourselves in it are required, right? We can't just be thinking about quick fixes all the time. I think some of these are deeply metaphysical <laughs> questions that have political consequence. Um, and because of this, I realize this approach may seem unsatisfying to many, um, since it offers no, you know, precisely no quick fix nor direct program of immediate action. Uh, but my premise here is that while we do, of course, need uh, you know, direct action in many cases, we also need to be reworking the very grounding of thought. Uh, and certain well-entrenched assumptions from the bottom up if we're going to have a chance to make, you know, to make our current history non-total or incomplete. Um, you know, this is, this is kind of in order to break out of this cycle of changeless change as, as Seb uses it in his book. Um, so to be transparent, the, the, I'm, working uh, I'm working from a, a, a navigational framework. Um, and I'll explain that as we go. Um, but the politics to it are bound to making claims on, on markers of orientation, which I'll describe in a sec. So basically the argument I'd like to rehearse with you is that while technologies have sort of operationally uh, unleashed us into this planetary paradigm, you know, many of our fundamental concepts remain trapped in 19th century pictures of, of what being a human is. And these have, were, you know, ushered in through Renaissance era spatial diagrams, spatial understandings. Uh, making this condition navigationally inoperative, right? Our concepts are not commensurate with the operations of technological reality. So with this incommensurability between operational conditions and conceptual frames of reference seems to point to is that we're kind of increasingly subordinated to technology, right? We're kind of like, yeah, it's ruling us, rather than technology becoming instrumental for collective emancipation. Um, and so just you know, just before diving into what navigation could be at planetary dimensions, I just think it's helpful to, to map out what do I mean by this term navigation in the first place. Um, so the first part of navigation is that it's a synthetic operation. So what I mean by that, it's the, it's the mediation of intentions, intentionality, uh, with the contingency of unknown or accidental events. So navigation is not a destination, but it's also not entirely divorced from destination either. It's a movement of inclination that require these markers of orientation, um, and it's because of this necessity for markers of orientation that its politics are connected to the construction or invention of these points of reference, and importantly, as well as making them sensible, intelligible, and shareable. Um, so second is navigation is, is reliant on these kind of mental diagrams of space and time or systems that are continually cross-referenced with situational uh, localization or some type of embodiment, right? Like it's kind of, you're always checking between these two uh, domains. So in this way, navigation encapsulates this kind of continuum between the conceptual and the material. And it's because of this feed the feedback that we can kind of continually revise and update our, you know, our choreography, right, the inscription of space, as well as our points of orientation over time. So as the saying goes, the map is not the territory. However, if we kind of arrest that in its purely oppositional state, as is usually the case, um, we kind of lose sight of this really important synthetic feedback dynamic, uh, wherein the map sort of partially shapes, um, you know, 
the perception or perceptibility of a territory or a system in question, um, how that territory or system is, is thought to exist beyond immediate sensory uh, feedback. And this, you know, this may be sound abstract, but for example, we can't sense climate change, right? We can sense the weather, we can't sense climate change. I mean, so these are already abstractions that we're gonna have to learn to negotiate, right? So this is not, it may sound like it's distant academic language, but it's very much practicable. practicable. Um, see, the map also kind of uh, deals with the possibility of space of imagined traction, right? Like you, it gives you a sense of how you may intervene in a system or, or a landscape. Um, and I think the, you know, the, the synthetic uh, dynamic also helps us understand uh, causation better, right? That we're not any longer in this kind of uh, mechanical linear causation, uh, not always, right? In, in this kind of scenario, if I knock this off the table, yes, that's a kind of mechanical way, but in the way that my simply being a wealthy European person has nonlinear effects through the world to other bodies, entities, landscapes that I'll never see is a nonlinear mode of causation. And we maybe intellectually know we're kind of part of that, but we don't necessarily behave or transform our self-understanding simply due to that abstract knowledge. So to me, this is a, it's always kind of pointing to this, this difficulty that we in, we're in between knowing something, but not knowing how to change ourselves because of what we know or how to exist in what we newly know. Um, so the map could be a story, it could be a drawing, it could be a diagram, it could be a mathematical model. Um, it may be different from the territory or the system to which it's referring, um, but it informs the way it's conceived and rendered accessible as a navigational entity. So cartography can be said, of course, is never neutral um, nor innocent, it's been, it's been deeply abused but it can be understand as abusive precisely when this abstraction of the map or mental schematics remains fixed and unresponsive to situated localization. Um, and the, the last point, and I think a lot of us you know, sense this kind of intuitively, is, is to say navigation pre presupposes the existence of a navigable thing. And when it comes to our present, uh, how navigable, navigable is the world and its complex you know, multi-dimensionality. Um, the answer is obviously not very navigable at, the, at present. So in thinking through the politics of navigation, it's crucial to consider, you know, several related questions. You know, for whom or what is navig navigability optimized? Uh, for whom or what is the very possibility of navigation foreclosed? And through what power dynamics are these possibilities determined? So it's just to say that ready-to-hand navigation can't be presupposed. Um, it can't be assumed as a given. So the activity of navigating is kind of inseparable from questioning our frames of reference for making conditions navigable at all. So since the planetary denotes an object that is incredibly complex, um, it surpasses the capacity of a single individual heroic you know, human intellection, it can only be partially accessible at a collective or distributed level. So in other words, it's to say that planetary navigability can only be figured as an equally intricate collective project. The necessary you know, geometries, narrations, uh, epistemologies, images, and interfaces in sort of both operational and linguistic form um, to sort of make this planetary dimension available to navigation seems to be in a nascent state if it's even existing at all. But it's precisely on these last points that I think it's incredibly important to raise this, this, this question within an art or architecture or design context because I think we actually have a crucial role to play in, in creating these interfaces of access to these kind of almost unfathomably scalar phenomena that were to make it amenable to thought, to make it amenable to experience. Um, I don't think this is just a you know, clearly this is not just a scientific question or something. Um, and yeah, okay, so sort of cleared, cleared up what, what, uh, <laughs> what some of these dynamics are. The other point that's maybe just like worth to say, because I keep repeating this word complexity, and there's a, there's a very interesting uh, uh, 
designer here, American designer based in, in Amsterdam. I remember seeing a talk by him talking about uh, that you know, complex systems has actually become a mode of wealth extraction, which was not a way that I had framed before. His, his name is Ben Cervini, and he was talking about basically how you know, all these kind of complex systems are only accessible on an institutional scale, like banks, risk management, all of these sorts of things. So there's a kind of a, there needs to be a claim on, on politicizing this and not always maintaining complexity within the realm of a privatized uh, wealth extraction mechanism as it is the case. So again, I think it's important. I'm gonna to try to pepper that a little bit through the talk because I know I tend to have a lot of uh, emphasis on some things that maybe seem abstract, but I'm gonna to try to pepper it with moments from time to time to show like what some of the consequences may be so that we can just kind of keep it touching down to earth. Um, the other kind of term that I just wanted to clear up, because the other one we're obviously using is planetary, right? So, uh, and we've seen that term a lot in the last, you know, in the last sort of decade, I would say at least in my field of discourse, um, typically using the word planetary scale, right? And it's usually used in, in discussing, uh, in, in discourses on climate catastrophe and ubiquitous computation to sort of map this condition of convergence between Earth systems, human activity, economic activity, and technological proliferation. Um, and I'd just like to propose a slight adjustment to this term insofar as one criticism I have with this planetary scale is that it's often seen as interchangeable with just like vast systemic largesse, right? Like just massive scale. Um, and, or just pure largeness. Um, and while we're, it is, it's true and it's beneficial that we have this kind of return to thinking totalities again, I think one of the risks of only seeing it in this largeness side is that it eclipses the local, right? It, it just, it either just, it doesn't want to deal with it or it's just like outright eclipsing it. And so I would like to suggest planetary dimensionality um, because I think it maintains this fidelity to, to like model this totality um, as, you know, as best as possible, right? I mean, there's always going to be incomplete, imperfect models of, of you know, Earth's social systems, but it, it introduces nested scales of coexistence within that totality. So you can almost imagine it like uh, Matryoshka dolls, right? Nested scales of, of coexistence. Um, and I think it, it, it also is there to create a framework for thinking difference and location, you know, both at, within, and for planetary, uh, you know, this kind of complex big world. Um, and the idea with, with insisting on this term dimensionality rather than scale, and maybe it's just a subtle difference, is that um, this dimensionality angle, it emphasizes the composition, not the end result, but the composition of this scale as produced by multiplied tangents of relations between bodies and things that shape contemporary coexistence, right? Because basically in our age, you've just got this proliferation of connections, some conscious, some unconscious, some willed, some unwilled, etc. And so these kind of vectors of interconnection between humans, non-humans, geological entities, and so on, has just sort of multiplied. And what I like about this dimensionality um, term is that it is emphasizing the, the, the building up to that scale through these vectors of relationality rather than just focusing on this, on this like, totality as such. Um, so again, it's, it's the idea to place prominence on the problem of scale from the vantage point of proliferation of interrelations rather than this sort of impossible gazing uh, from this you know, monolithic hole. And again, I think one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I want to point out some of the stakes in this framing. Um, and I think it's worth highlighting that in, you know, if we contrast with the far right turn we see happening across the globe at the moment, um, it's precisely a move away um, from such planetary complexities. Uh, or it's a guarding of this complexity for private financial gain, as I just explained with, with the Ben Cerveny example. Um, and the far right prefers rather to subtra subtract themselves from these kind of interrelations, setting up you know, more walls of enclosure, willfully ignoring this kind of interrelated reality, and doubling down on national purity or ethno-national uh, cages of familiarity. So as I see it, there's also to be a sort of commitment to the premise of creating equitable social and ecological conditions in the world 
as a counter-hegemonic project, um, fighting for what coexistence ought to be at planetary dimensions. Um, it forges a kind of critical antagonism against this sort of tendency, um, a tendency that, you know, it thrives off a morally bankrupt and, you know, frankly, epistemologically er uh, erroneous small world mentality. Um, so, of course, that said, there's like several risk factors that we want to take into consideration. There's more than what I'm discussing now. Um, when speculating on this planetary dimensionality, uh, and, and you know the question of how it could serve as a vehicle or a concept for political mobilization, progressive political mobilization. And the first and the most obvious you know, factor is just this critical question of how to contend with scale as such. Um, how can this total scale be rendered socially non-totalitarian? I think that's really a big fear and a legitimate fear when you start talking about scale. Because historically, of course, um, a lot of these scalar ambitions have been synonymous with forms of domination, conformance, or homogenization. So this correlation is evidenced, of course, by the you know, current and dwindling form of so-called globalization, uh, unilateral globalization built, um, built up in the word, this is what Yuqui calls it, particular epistemologies from a regional worldview, aka Europe, um, to a putatively global metaphysics. Um, of course, additionally, we see this in the ongoing oppressions of colonial subjection and including managerial derivatives of the colonial project. So we should be, by all means, skeptical of scale. This is a risky proposition. Um, and another factor, but another, let's say more, is a more conceptual but more affirmative factor uh, when trying to imagine the possibility of, you know, possibility of an emancipatory planetary dimensionality is to kind of ask how this nth dimensional, right, this kind of multi-dimensional abstraction of coexistence works back upon and transforms the way we understand ourselves, right? So planetary dimensionality isn't just an external condition, um, but it provides a conceptual opportunity to, to reframe where the human uh, stands within this scale, uh, and you know, it, it, it forces a repositioning from which other pathways and logics for navigating the world sort of just cascade. So what new perspectives are opened when human self-picturing is repositioned at and within this kind of nested uh, dimensions of coexistence? Um, what other modes of relation unfold from the repositioning of this picture? Um, and I think this is also important especially uh, for those of us in the, in the creative arts, um, how can the consequences of this pers perspectival shift be uh, meaningfully narrated, right? And that's, that's, a, that's a kind of crucial point. Um, so if there's to be any sort of just political navigation you know, of and at the planetary dimension, um, I think these fundamental factors need to be accounted for. Um, and I think they connect very well to this kind of conceptual material activity of navigating, right, that synthetic operation between concepts and material, map and territory, etc., idea and body. Um, so it's just to say that when we figure out, when we kind of lay down these, these considerations, uh, what we can sort of deduce, what we can say as a sort of, let's say, uh, not goal, but criteria, let's say, is that if we want to begin imagining navigation at planetary dimensions without it becoming a mode of enforced uniformity, um, this common structural condition of coexistence at multiple dimensions needs to be approached with a commitment, of, uh, with a commitment to the preservation of uncommon localized distinctions. So otherwise formulated, we need to be asking, what are the politics of location at planetary dimensions? So, for those of you uh, from feminist epistemologies, there's a, this is obviously you'll recognize that sort of uh, that, that, that line of approach of saying like, what are your politics of location? Um, so it's an important legacy from feminist epistemologies, uh, this kind of call for a, a politics of location. It emphasizes an accounting of, but also accountability to specificity in order to avoid this sort of tyranny of uh, diminishing differentiation of the world into a kind of a reductive picture of totality. 
So the question provokes a situated accounting for the local geo-historical uh, context from which one speaks, thinks, relates, learns, acts. In other words, a conscious activity, a self-conscious activity of positioning knowledge makers. So as Donna Haraway wrote, uh, an insistence on this positioning um, is not simply about um, it's not simply about revealing bias and scientific misuse. Um, it also elaborates on a mode of objectivity understood to be productively partial. Um, and since knowing, you know, and she's including both propositional, material, and tacit forms of knowing, um, comes from this partial objectivity, it's informed by the contingencies of a spe specified place. So importantly, and I think this is really crucial to, to, to you know, highlight, these partial or locatable knowledges, they are not instances of a sort of anything goes relativism, right? It's not, you can't, situated knowledge is not your opinion, right? It's like, it's something much more robust than that. Um, it's, uh, as she says, you know, as, as Haraway says, this kind of anything goes relativism, it, it only serves as this kind of mirror twin uh, for this apositional mode of objectivity or the God's eye trick that she's precisely trying to avoid. Um, but rather, we need to understand situated knowledges as, a, as, as is in her words, gateways for webs of connection called uh, solidarity in politics and shared conversations in epistemology. So part of the value of this situational insistence, of course, is that it, it Haraway sees in this ways to be more accountable to reality, uh, to build better accounts and be better accountable to reality. But where this situational insistence offers us less guidance is is an approaching coherence. How do those relays of, of, you know, how do those conversations or relays between epistemological localizations cohere into something that is shared, shared knowledge? Um, so how can, the question is how can situatedness be formulated in consideration of this multidimensional relationality um, by relations that are both near and distant, uh, by those which are immediately perceivable and those which are simply not. Uh, so one of the central problems posed by the proposition of political orientation at planetary dimensions is how to simultaneously uphold these multiple scales of relationality. So right, this is like edging us into, this is a myriological uh, part to whole, one to many, many to one problem, which is about as old as one gets in philosophy. But I think the stakes for working through this problem today are kind of an urgent matter for social pragmatics, in fact. It's not just a wanky philosophical game anymore. They're actually, we, this is gonna actually become part of, of how we could imagine coexistence at planetary dimensions. Um, and so there's already a shared inclination in this, in this sort of framing, in this muriological way, or this, this focus on relationality, uh, found in the work of Edouard Glisson, uh, towards the end of the 20th century, where he's kind of coming up with this uh, this concept of the of the one world, tout monde, right? Um, so Glissant's tout monde is a uh, it's 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 one composed it's a vastly different world, including the representations, cartographies, and mental pictures of it, uh, making it impossible to speak from the whole of the whole from a single position. So it's he recognizes this this tout, tout monde, one world but it is not homogenous. This is kind of important. So he, he, the negotiation of this kind of multiplicity um, for Glissant comes to the, the enactment of what he proposed as a world mentality, right? So here he's, he's kind of morphing from uh, mondialisation, which is globalization in French, to mondialité. So world mentality is mondialité in French. So he's kind of trying to give a different spin to the flattening forces of globalization while maintaining some fidelity to the types of relations that are opened up by it. Um, and it kind of interestingly enough, he was often critical of globalization. One of the points of critique of a globalization as we live it was that he said it was driven by a non-site or a non-place mentality, right? So we, this is again one of the reasons why we want to uphold this idea of the importance of positioning. Um, so his focus on relationality with regards to specificity or difference of location, it, it preserves this particularity while also addressing the connected embeddedness of, of that site 
insofar as no location is extractable from the totality of its relations, despite its specificity, right? You can't just extract Den Bosch, right? It is connected, it is embedded in different scalar relations, so it's a kind of error to imagine as if it is just extractable. Um, and I think one of the maybe less talked about consequences of, of thinking in that way uh, in terms of this nested picture of specificity and not a subtractive one is that it's, it's a kind of important theoretical move that undercuts uh, a reductive claims that link specificity to individualism. This is, I think, a really important legacy of, of or consequence of this thought. So, again, from a, from a distant field, uh, there's been like leaps of invention in this part to whole problems uh, to be found in mathematics. Uh, precisely the second half of the 21st century saw a working through of what the mathematician René Thom, uh, called this the, the founding aporia of mathematics, and that is this the dialectic between the discrete, which is ultimately the particular, um, and the continuous or the global. So uh, Alexander Grothendieck, uh, he was a mathematician, a climate activist, and vehement uh, critic of scientism. He actually co-founded the group uh, Survivre et Vivre, like Survive and Live. So this was like a really 1970s activist, you know, francophone community activists between France and Montreal, kind of journal. Uh, so his alliances were, were always kind of in this ecology <laughs> sort of thing. Um, so he arrived at what's known as arithmetic geometry, where arithmetic and mathematics can be understood as signifying the discrete, and geometry signifies the continuous. So he kind of maps this out. He wrote this very long, like 900-page autobiography called the Recolte Semai, so Harvest and Sewing. Um, and he, he tries to detail in like slightly layperson terms, it's not entirely true, um, the scope of his uh, geometrical innovation, which, you know, according to most mathematicians, it's on par with the innovation of Euclid for his time, as well as Einstein's space-time relativity for that time. However, none of, we're, we're not even close to living out the consequences of these new spatial innovations. So this is a quote from Grothendieck. He says, as for geometry, one can say that in the 2,000 years in which it has existed as a science in the modern sense of the word, it has straddled these two kinds of structure, discrete and continuous. One can say that the new geometry is a synthesis between these two worlds, which though next to our neighbors and in close solidarity, were deemed separate. So obviously, I, you know, I'm not a specialist in mathematics, and the, thankfully there are, he wrote such a lay, so-called layperson text to give someone like me a point of access. But the, the only reason I wanted to detour through these two thinkers was to highlight that for both of them, from very different fields, um, there's no pitting of the discrete against the continuous. Um, they each refuse this kind of false choice. Um, and they put their efforts towards the articulation of a relational glue, right? I love this term, glue. There's a philosopher of mathematics, Fernando Zelamin, he's always talking about the glue, the gluing operation. So with focus on this glue that upholds the discrete and continuous scale simultaneously, right? And so this kind of gives a bit more nuance to a lot of discourses that are like, we only want to be local, or we only can think about the totality. I think the real labor is in figuring out what is that relation and how to activate that relationship. So, of course, each thinker from their own fields, uh, you know, the, it delivers their own set of consequences. I'm not trying to say Glissant's output is the same as Goltendi, not at all. Different consequences. Um, but in, you know, when we think through both authors, we see both modes that refigure spatial relations as well as relations to spatiality that I think offer important insights for navigation at planetary dimensions. Um, so, you know, most notably is that this results in a picture of being situated um, or position that is, you know, simultaneously discreetly located, but it's also inseparable from the continuous totality. You know, it's both. Um, and it's worth to pause on this and think for a second and imagine the consequences that kind of picture bears upon the myth of atomized individualism at work upon human self-images every day. When we tend to think of ourselves as, you know, self-enclosed private units, 
Um, so I think this kind of relational picture of selfhood is, is maybe sort of pointing towards what we could speculatively call a deprivatized picture of self, which would be perhaps an interesting um, uh, you know, thought experiment. Um, so through this kind of synthesis of this discrete and the continuous, we can, we can now say that locations or sites, they don't only exist, they, they only exist and have relations to neighborhoods of broader contexts. Um, and this relationality feeds back into them. Uh, this means that sites or situations are co-constituted by extra-local relations, right? And this kind of goes in a two-way. I mean, the arrows go in both directions, right? The site also emanates qualities uh, in excess of its own enclosure. Um, and I'd just like to point out that, you know, today this isn't really even an abstract idea, frankly speaking, um, despite how I'm perhaps framing it, but it's part of our everyday life every time we go online, right? Like, being online entails relations with the locations that serve as material sites for the extraction of, of you know, of, of the materials to, to, to make the machines, um, connections to the specific laborers who do that, to that work, um, and additionally, this sort of computational parsing of our requests, right? Every time we do a search, click a button, what have you, um, this, this initiates, uh, you know, chain reactions, what's called columns in a computational stack across variously geolocated jurisdictions and entities at once, right? Regardless of our happenstance physical location. So all I'm trying to say is that in operational terms, we are multiply and distributively situated. Um, and I think to acknowledge this doesn't erase the, you know, I'm not trying to erase the concretely differential, I'm not trying to equate that multiple, you know, that distributed situatedness with the experience of, of you know, a concrete experience. Um, I don't think it erases that, that, um, that, that experience of locational embodiment, but it does offer us a more extensive local, extra local picture of being situated in view of the sort of path dependencies that, that make up this uh, planetary dimension. So with that in mind, we can say location is partially defined by this specificity of experience, right? The difference of the, of the, of the location, but it's irreducible to that which can be directly experienced. So again, although this may appear to be a trivial academic framing, I think we are, we are already gesturing to both scales of location when we, when we commonly say words like systemic oppression, right? Uh, because there's basically the causal forces of distributed localizations, right, the system that co-produce a concretely localized, which is an embodied, lived, and known experience of oppression. So I don't think it's so trivial to be framing it in this way. So what I'm pointing to is that basically to define a location, uh, to, find, to define something as local, right? And this is a word we use all the time and we kind of understand each other when we say it, oh, it's local. And, you know, we kind of have this implicit uh, understanding. But there's actually something much more elaborate going on behind the scenes because to define something as local, it requires an implicit articulation of a geometric threshold. We're kind of drawing a perimeter around local. The term is usually taken as self-evident. It's one that implies specific and contingent uh, spatial norms, very specific scales, uh, perspectives, and abstractions at work, um, and they're almost never made explicit. And so basically they draw a border between a general, uh, a general territory and a particular instance. So I think what's fascinating about uh, working through a term like local is it provokes us a kind of helpful moment to scrutinize certain assumptions of, of the scales of operation and what we're thinking. Um, for example, what is the border condition of location? Uh, and at what threshold does the local cease to be local? It's not, you know, if you, it's an interesting kind of thought experiment. Um, from which perspectival position are these thresholds drawn? Um, and of course the answers are, are many because with these dilemmas signal is, you know, location is a relative and not absolute spatial concept. Uh, <laughs> so, 
how does the multi-scalar understanding of location as this, you know, again, this kind of continuum of the concrete and the abstract, how does it affect the, the relative perspective from which situatedness is understood at planetary dimensions? Um, how, would, how are we to understand positioning within this framework? Um, because, of course, it's always dependent on self-consciously locating the knowledge maker. Um, but now it's a, a locatability that is uh, framed in this kind of nested, in this nested and perspectively different dimensions. Um, and I think there's, a, there's an interesting bi-directional answer to pursue here. And on the one hand, we can understand positioning from, this, from the location of a particular, you know, phenomenal human, like kind of probably how you feel yourself in the everyday. Um, but then the location of, of uh, the, you know, to think about that, this, this kind of version of yourself, uh, in relation to the general location of, of, of the human conceptual self-images, right? And that's what we're going to get to in just in a sec, is like, uh, how do we understand the position of where the human creature is as an abstraction, and how do we create that, that relational glue between that conceptual image and how we feel ourselves as phenomenal human beings in a relatively limited spatial um, context. So if the position of the human at planetary mention, uh, dimensions is a decentered one, right? it's no longer the, the centrifugal force of, 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 of everything, <laughs> um, and it's no longer conceivable as this kind of heroic, autonomous, you know, human figure separate from the ground um, and masterfully dominant over the world, how does this play into the navigational synthesis between the conceptual and the material in the mutual influence between the abstract and the concrete? So just more simply, how does this decentered picture of the human work back upon us uh, as a kind of form of cognitive agency? Um, towards the way we come to account for our particular and general situatedness in this sort of multi-dimensional frame of reference um, that is of course informed by concrete relations but it's irreducible to them. Um, so once again, I just want to point out that, uh, you know, to kind of touch it back down to earth, some of the consequences of what I'm suggesting, so they can be sort of understood outside of this more theoretical framing. Um, and I think we're at a moment where there are, there are those who are championing and, and who are actively seeking to amplify this sort of navigational turbulence that is, um, that is produced by this decentered human uh, at planetary dimensions. Um, so I think it's like, there is a reason to make, it, make this an urgent call for claims on orientations. And these sort of tendencies tend to thrive among uh, several techno-neo-reactionaries who want to deny any form of planetary navigability from this resituated human. Um, and this is largely due because they tend to naturalize capitalism as if it's a fact of nature, when of course it's, it's absolutely not. Um, and they ultimately advocate for the stripping of humanity's you know, political agencies to transform given historical frames of reference. So paradoxically, what is often perceived as a form of a you know, techno-fetishist futurism is nothing but an unimaginative conservatism that celebrates the preservation of existing forms, uh, frames of reference. Um, and these frames of reference are defended as if they're an immutable fact of nature a world naturally oriented by 19th century navigational frameworks of the, econo the construction of the economic man, um, now augmented by 21st century AI, smart cities, and iPhones. Um, and I just want to point out the implicit endorsements for dehumanization um, can be found in this sort of destructive negation of these capacities to change our histories, right? Um, and I don't think... I don't think this is the case because a lot of times the techno-neo-reactionaries tend to traffic in, you know, the criticism of them is that they, they traffic in images of machinic supremacy on the surface, that the machines will be better than us and so on. I don't think that's the reason, um, even if it's mainly the point of critique. Um, but I think it amounts, what, what is the problem is that it amounts to a renunciation of the capacity to make claims, for, for humans to make claims on their artificial nature of humanity as a fictitious necessity to construct points of collective orientation, right? Um, this is something that is like, that 
you know, a figure like Sylvia Winter calls us both biological and mythological. So the narrations we tell about ourselves are also a form of agency. And basically, there's a tendency to kind of strip that agency away. And meanwhile, we're critiquing the fact that, or a humanist position would maybe critique the fact that, oh, they say the machines are going to be better than us. Uh, I don't think that's actually the worst thing. I think the worst is that they're actually you know, dehumanizing us by taking this artificial capacity to narrate ourselves into a different history away. Um, so in the end, reveling in this sort of chaotic perpetuation of navigational turbulences at this planetary dimensions is nothing more than an uninventive fossilization of status quo fictions as if they're given in permanent facts. Um, so I think at this juncture it becomes evident that part of the struggle for orientation within these nested dimensions of, of planetarity um, demands intervention precisely on this artificial plane in order to sort of dislodge these naturalized conservatisms that, are, that very often take the disguise of a blinking futurity. Uh, there is nothing there. It's utter conservatism. And I think this is where the work of Sylvia Winter has been very inspirational for me the last year. Um, we're, we're wrapping up. Is everyone doing okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Sylvia Winter's work has been really helpful. Um, since she's, re she's crucially theorized that no historical social you know, paradigm shift exists without a corresponding concept of the human, with, you know, without a new construction of the concept of a human that kind of grounds its logics. Uh, and its modes of justifying actions or decisions, and frames of reference for just simply making sense of the world. Um, so as mentioned, as these kind of hybrid biomythos creatures, uh, as she frames us, of course, not unlike Donna Haraway's nature culture, uh, you know, uh, portmanteau, you know, basically none of our social reality would be possible without the conception, conceptual engineering of a particular genre of being human, to use her, to use Winter's expression, so this basically this, this genre or concept of being human, it operates like a template uh, for human forms and sets of proper activity, proper with like, you know, uh, quote, air quotes, proper activities. And it's an idealization uh, whose modes of reproduction are sort of, they're bolstered by social organizational uh, structures that incentivize adaption to this idealized concept. Um, and this, this positive feedback loop uh, is what she, takes from Franz Fanon is called the sociogenic principle. So it basically naturalizes a particular model of a, of a human idealization or human concept. Um, and of course it others all entities and beings that are not in conformance with that idealized templating, what she calls self-troping, you know, uh, mechanism. Um, and, you know, and to, you know, I kind of like this term too. I think it operates as a domesticating force for certain behaviors, certain activities. Um, so it's due to this sociogenic dynamic where we can say that, you know, paradigmatic, epistemic, and political change, we can really see that it's bound to how genres of being human are conceived. Uh, meaning that even if we're trying to escape, you know, the, the sort of perils of more anthropocentric narcissism, to focus on the human, given this kind of way that it operates as a reproductive template model, you can still focus on the, on the human uh, you know, in a scholarly way without it turning into another mode of anthropocentric narcissism. Um, so in response to the totalizing effects of this unilateral globalization ushered in through the logic of what Winner has, I think, aptly called a monohumanist human, and all that is is, a, is basically uh, the result is the you know, homo economicus that has been that, you know, that quote that I said before about that regionally, regionally specific view to a putatively metaphysical scale, it's precisely that regional view of the homo economicus regime in Europe that is now inflated to this scale. Um, she asserts the need that we construct genres of being human made to the measure of the planetary as a way to contend with this now wholly inseparable and tangled totality. Um, so of course, how this you know, measuring up of humanity is to be imagined in a way that encompasses uh, you know, both this accounting for this multidimensional coexistence, but is also accountable to contingent localized differentiation is of course the big question. Um, and I think for now we can at least start to answer that question in the negative, since there's obviously no ambition to perpetuate uh, the, you know, the, the, you know, perpetuate the precedent of creating 
creating planetary conditions from the absolutizing of a particular perspective. By that I just mean an inflated perspective blown up to the scale of the planetary, right? That is not, that is not a, uh, that, you know, this is a kind of reduction that gives us no model for, um, uh, for orientation that is commensurate with the planetary. Um, so answering to this measure of the planetary necessitates these kind of multi-dimensional approaches that can account for and be accountable to differentiation, complexity, uh, and systems of human and non-human interdependence without this kind of malicious comforts of, of familiarity, uh, simplification, uh, or confirmation of, of the familiar. So I think there exists no non-homogenizing way of approaching this multi-dimensional condition with frames of reference that are only actionable within our small world framework. And I just want to highlight a, a kind of crucial distinction. Um, I can stop soon if you guys are getting tired. I really have been going on for a while. Uh, but maybe, yeah, make an insistence on this. So a crucial distinction needs to be made at this stop, at this step between the inflation of you know, this locally situated uh, concept of the scale of a big world on one hand, and on the other hand, the situating of concept creation within a big world perspective. I think those are two vastly different operations. I think they're gonna take a lot of experimentation to figure out exactly how to practice that, but I think they're two very different sets of ambitions because one has an inherently uh, conformist mode to it, the other one is about building relations or being cognizant of this profound uh, interrelation and trying to be accountable to them as best as possible. I think those are very different approaches. So just to highlight that a small world perspective can be understood as this kind of subtractive or extractive correlation to reality, um, where these borders of positional location are kind of self-evidently drawn um, in conformance with the kind of accustomed proportions of a, of a ready at hand uh, immediate human experience. So we can even imagine this kind of Vitruvian man diagram, right, with this like the Leonardo with the circle. So we very often are still performing within that spatial paradigm. Um, and a big world's uh, perspective, of course, it doesn't disavow small world localization. Uh, it's, it's the only and necessary point of departure. It can't be avoided. Right? Otherwise, we just jump willy-nilly to this scale of totality. So it's a necessary point of departure, but it does insist on the insufficiency of such positioning in isolation to be accountable to planetary dimensions. So big world positioning demands a nested account of situatedness, where location is no longer figured as self-evidently enclosed, um, despite its differential status, but is rather imagined as a synthesis between the immediate and the concrete, and the dimensional vectors of relation that co-constitute it. So I'd just like to also say that like, this big world perspective isn't necessarily, although it's ambitious, it's not driven by this hubristic ambition, uh, a hubristic ambition towards this illusory, you know, perfect vision of totality. Um, these perspectives, of course, are partial like any other. Uh, the ambition is rather to introduce a better accounting for the transformation of spatial conception and dimensionality at this scale in order precisely to avoid the violent pitfalls, pitfalls of, of conflating the part with the whole and deploying that misgiving as a kind of definitive navigational marker. So I don't know how you're doing because I realize I've been going for a while. I have a couple more pages. I could stop now because it would be also a... No, we need to conclude then. Need to conclude? Yeah. Okay, you you concur? It's like you're not dying. Sorry. Nobody, you know, we're all fascinated. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how interesting it is for everyone. Um, okay, but at least we have a nice Very. more and oh longer picture. Very. <laughs> okay, so in conclusion. You missed that. Come on. <laughs> so in conclusion, um, and again, I hope this. I really hope it does have resonance. I mean, maybe we'll speak about it more directly in the master class for those of you who are going to be in the class tomorrow, because I really want to talk about what this means for us as practitioners, because I actually think, I hope it's conveyed. If it's not, we're going to really nail it down tomorrow together. Um, but in conclusion, spatially and geometrically speaking, I just want to highlight that in the Renaissance classical perspective, it coincided with the conceptual development of this monohumanist human that we talked about, right? The genre of human centrality where reality is imagined as optimizable in its own image. 
uh, you know, familiar image, and knowing is reduced to a picturing of the world uh, as but a separate resource from human projects, right? So this is a famous figure ground relationship, right? And that's something that has really got to be overcome. There's loads of philosophers working on undoing that uh, with, from, you know, from within the history of Western thought. Correspondingly, in this classical perspective, the reenactment of human vision in this two-dimensional plane became mechanized and reproducing images wherein the extra local, right, um, it vanishes at the threshold of a horizon. So it's, it's basically a subtractive mode of representation. This mode of representing a position of the human, it works to reinforce the narrow depiction of what a location is by extracting it from extra local uh, relations. And so it basically merely, merely mirrors uh, the the limitations of human biosensory visual systems that have reconstructed or restricted depths of vision and that tend to privilege immediate proximity. Um, so moreover, in both common and academic language, uh, the horizon, as many of you know who are interested in futurity, uh, it's become a kind of automated term of choice and it usually is used to refer to a sense of expansiveness, or a way to loosely gesture to an unknown, futural, becoming phenomenon. But I just really want to insist that at this multi-dimensional or nth dimensional mode of coexistence, the horizon is simply an inadequate correlation to reality. You've got to drop it. Spatially, representationally, and linguistically, it has no existence in reality, and it can only reflect on small world proportions. Okay, in fairness, the horizon may be useful at an everyday mechanical scale of the world, to be sure, but at planetary dimensions, it stands in as, as, a, as a mere representational artifact for the mono-humanist world. And it's kind of funny how we keep using it. <laughs> it's so ubiquitous. Um, so what is crucial, however, you know, to, to kind of re re reclaim from that, you could say successful example, right? There was this mode of classical perspectivalism, uh, and humanism were extremely successful projects. So what, however, to glean from this historical example is the mutual influence between an emerging, you know, abstract concept of the genre of being human at the time and a representational system for spa spatializing it and basically representing positioning back to the human itself. Um, for, so basically it turned the concept to a system of envisioning the world because it had a representational, a re reproducible representational schematic behind it, behind it. So my feeling is that planetary dimensionality needs a similar picturing and spatializing approach for a new genre of being human commensurate with this different mode of spatiality. In order to better account for multidimensional coexistence without the comforts embodied by a relative nearness of the horizon of a discrete or small world remediated back to us in our own image, uh, the big world demands perspectives from a position of nested location, composed of but irreducible to happenstance, uh, personal geophysical location. So to hypothesize on seeing, hearing, uh, moving, relating, and communicating from within this big world requires experimenting with techniques for accessing its unfamiliar, often opaque, nested scales, for making its aggregate spatiality you know, available to navigation at all. It's one thing to name the decentered human and this planetary dimensionality. I realize uh, planetary dimension situatedness, throwing around words. It's quite another to learn how to coexist uh, in the consequences of those um, concepts meaningfully with material, epistemic, and, um, and, and gestural, social ramifications. So considered navigation at this planetary scale, to my mind, will be impossible with tools, language, concepts, uh, spatial figurations that belong only to a small world frame of reference. Um, if there's any navigational optimism for this condition, a kind of realist optimism, it will be vitalized to mobilize existing vectors of this, exi you know, the, these, these interrelations already exist. We'll have to mobilize the existing vectors of multidimensional relationality otherwise in an effort to combat the exploitative incentives and concepts that, that ushered their com very coming into being. So that incentive is predicated on the most pernicious fiction of the mono-humanist genre of being human, the myth, and we've repeated this a few times, the myth of atomized personhood whose idea of wealth 
belongs only to the smallest possible world. So if existing relations are to be otherwise catalyzed against the inflation of small world exploitation, and of course this like 1% meme captures this very well, it's not just a world mentality that's required, but also big world frames of reference through which to hypothesize possibilities for non-radiant coexistence at this horizonless multi-dimension. So I'll just end there, and thank you so much for your very long attention.